Once again, you know, it's a privilege to come. It's a privilege to come and just to speak about what Christ is doing in our lives. And we come simply to encourage with our stories, to encourage you. The same God who's at work in us is the same God who's at work in you. And you know, every single time we come here, there's a wonderful presence of Jesus, a wonderful presence of Jesus. And as I was sitting there, I was thinking about the pastor, Keith and Ken, and how they keep welcoming us back and back again. I just want to say publicly, thank you. Thank you. Gareth will take that back, I know. Thank you for welcoming us in to Trinity Church. And I think we should just pray for the pastor before we even go into the program that we're bringing tonight and just ask God to bless him this evening. So if that's okay with you, I'm going to do that and then I'm going to hand over to Beverly. So Father, we thank you. We thank you that you've allowed us to come into this house today. We thank you that you drew each one of us. Wherever we were, you drew us into your presence today because you wanted to meet with us. And we thank you for men of faith who have planted their lives into this house and who have established a work that you are ongoing and and moving in this place and in this area through. And so we just lift the pastor to you tonight. I know his heart would be to be here in this house. And whatever it is his illness, We know that you are the God who is able. You're able to reach out and to touch him this night and to release him from whatever it is that has come upon his body. We ask, O God, that you give him a peace that goes beyond his understanding and he knows your blessing and your anointing right where he is this day. We pray in Jesus' name. And as we go through our program, Lord, could you open hearts, for you did draw each one here. And already what has been said, I know, Lord, that you are at work in individual lives. And so I pray, open hearts, shut the mouth of the enemy so he cannot interrupt any of your work. This night I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I forgot to say I'm Alicia and I'm the centre manager. There we go. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. That's, that's not even a proper good evening. Good evening, everyone. We're in the presence of the Lord. I wasn't worship amazing. It really, can this go lower? Because I'm only sure. Can I take it down a bit? high for me. I'm only tiny. Oh, not that tiny. <laughs> it's okay, that's okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, yes, yes, I'm not going to go over what Alicia said, but you know, this is one of our most favourite churches to come to because we just love the worship, we love the atmosphere, we just love coming. You know, we'd come every week if we could, but however. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to take up any more time, but before I go ahead, Christmas is coming. So if you could, you know, spend a little time at our, our little stall there. You know, the girls work and make this. This is part of their activities on, in the afternoon, you know, to help raise money, to keep us afloat. There's some lovely things there, you know, some really imaginative things. So just take some time and have a look. So without any further ado, you all know me. I've been here so many times. Beverly, just in case you don't. And, uh, and I'm going to call Kelly Marsden and she's going to share a scripture with you. It's Psalm 91 and it's It will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge Um, Just when you come to Teen Challenge um, like you're just covered by the Holy Spirit his presence, you've shelter you've shown so much love and he just stole you and yeah like I love that scripture, it means a lot to me it's one that's held me all the way through thank you Amen Amen. That's wonderful, I think that's Probably Kelly's probably first time, maybe, that she's been up here. So that's amazing. Psalms 91, we love it. We really do. So right now, our Hope House choir, we have a choir now. So they're going to come and they're going to minister to you.
Okay, hello everyone, my name's Chloe. Um, hiya, um, I'm a volunteer at Hope House. I go down every Friday and I lead a choir with the ladies. So I know we've been here before um, and sung for you before, but actually because of the way that the programme works, there's um, lots of new girls always coming in because they're going on and moving on with their new lives, which is amazing. So most of these women are new to the choir. So it's not easy stood, being stood up here. Most of them, well, all of them have been trapped in addiction for many, many years and are now free in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so, um, like I said, it's not easy being stood up here. So please encourage the ladies when, when they're singing and ministering. Feel free to worship and praise. You're obviously natural worshippers anyway. So please encourage us and stand if you'd like to. We're going to sing Good, Good Father because he is truly good. Amen. waiting for our backing track. <laughs>
Good, good, good father. That's who he is, amazing father. Lucy, come back. <laughs> That was lovely, wasn't it? Yeah. Amazing, amazing. Just to see, you know, girls that have only been in a week, you know, up here, girls that were so shy and, you know, couldn't say boo to a who, and they're up here just declaring what an amazing, good father he is. It's just, you know, it's emotional, really is brilliant. So Lucy's going to come and share her testimony right now. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, it's re it feels a really a real privilege to share my testimony here tonight because this was I think one of the first meetings I came to was here, um, and I came I'd only been a few weeks in the door and I just I remember it being a great church, um, and it's really nice to be back and I think nine months down the line and share my journey a bit, um, but just going back a bit, um, I came into Hope House in January, and. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a, a real journey. I think when I first came in, I thought, oh, it's, you know, I don't need that much doing, you know, I don't need that much to sort out. And But, yeah, God stepped in and told me otherwise. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so uh, a bit of my background. I came I came from a, a nice family. I can't profess that I've had a really awful childhood or anything like that. I haven't. Um, but it just goes to show that addiction isn't choosy. Um, you know, it, it doesn't pick and choose who it goes after. But um, it's interesting tonight that it's been mentioned about mental health and things like that. And, and for many, many years, um, that, that was my story really, was just cycles of struggling with mental health, with depression. And, and, and if you, when I say depression, I don't just mean, you know, like a down feeling. I, I mean like disabling depression where you can't get out of bed, you know. Um, people close to me had to actually pick me up and you know put me in the shower and wash me because I just couldn't physically do it myself and um, but what happened was when I was about 15 because um, my family life was a bit boring you know we, we grew up in church but I didn't see the excitement of having a relationship with Jesus um, it very much felt like that was my parents way of of what I thought was controlling me and so when my friends came along at 15 and introduced me to alcohol I thought I'd hit the jackpot you know it was like this is great this is so much fun um, you know I'd spend weekends um, lying about to my parents where I was going out drinking the usual sort of teenage story but um, I didn't realize the grip that it, ha it would have on me and then later on down the line when I struggled with mental health um, although I knew of Jesus and I, and I tried to have a relationship with him or what I thought was a relationship with him, um, alcohol just kept getting in the way. And um, yeah, it was a... Uh, I don't where I'm going with that. <laughs> it just, about five years ago, um, after I'd, I'd come out of a, quite a messy marriage, I, I was trying to be a Christian and the, the person I was married to wasn't. Um, and that didn't go too well and um, after that finished um, you'd think I would spend the time building my relationship with Jesus and um, but I didn't I got um, sidelined by another nice Christian guy who I thought was the answer to everything but unfortunately a year into that marriage um, depression really hit in and um, I just didn't have that foundation I think it is the biggest part of my testimony I just didn't have that foundation with Jesus it's one thing being in church and knowing about him and and you know being on the teams and being in the right circles and things like that but if you don't know him you, can, you just come crashing down and I really I came crashing down really badly and um, I ended up going into 24-7 drinking um, I used to drink you know at least a litre of vodka a day was my choice unfortunately um, you know, when I couldn't get hold of alcohol because family members had taken money off me and things like that, um, I'd resort to, to things like white spirit, paint stripper, things like that. I mean, I was in a real place of desperation. This wasn't just like, oh, I fancy a tipple after work. Um, you know, it took me to make some terrible decisions. Um, a lot of drink driving where either myself or someone else should have been really harmed, but thank God 
they weren't. Um, you know, I stand here today, I haven't had a bit of damage done to my body from what I've put it through, and I can only give that to God and give him all the glory to that. Um, yeah, he's good. <laughs> Um, and uh, but again, I, I go back to this. I just didn't have this foundation, this this relationship with Jesus, and so I was just going in this deadly cycle of depression, drinking, depression, drinking, and each time the drinking was getting worse. Um, and when unfortunately my um, my husband at the time, after five years of marriage, decided that he couldn't cope anymore, and I really thought I wouldn't. I, I thought I couldn't carry on. I thought, no, this is it. I can't. I can't do this anymore. But um, you know, God had been working in the background the whole time, and it's just amazing when you can't always see it. And I think that's what I just want to say as well. Just, just hang on in there because you can't always see what He's doing. Yeah. Um, but He brought someone into my parents' life and my life who, who not only knew about Hope House but knew Bev really well. He knew um, girls that had been through the program and the success and how God had changed their lives. And um, in January I came into the program um, through the help of Bev and Alan and Alicia. And uh, I can honestly say my life's never been the same since. It's, um, it, it's been amazing. I, I can li- the only thing that I stand on here today is grace because I, I should either be dead or I should be I don't know, in a mental hospital, I guess, somewhere, or, or just a lot worse than I am. But Hope House has been a really amazing place for, for giving me that safety um, and that love, but it, it's given me the real love that I needed, not just the, oh, let's sweep everything under the rug and make it all right. It's given me the love that's helped me to face things, uh, face decisions I've made. Uh, terrible decisions I've made. Um, it's given me the courage to, to keep going. It's given me the the fun to learn how to have a, a relationship with Jesus and what that really means. And it's so different to to religion. <laughs> it's just you know, it just really is. Um, yeah, so it's been it's been nine months, um, and you know, God. The thing I love about being in there is is God just brings out um, your giftings, your talents, everything. It's like um, I could play the piano, but I, I can play the piano now. <laughs> I've been in there, and um, I love watching the other girls and how they change. And when you come further along in the program, seeing how um, Jesus changes people, it's just amazing, isn't it? And um, I forgot where I was going with this. Sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's given me he's given me a hope. Um, he's given me excitement for the future, which I didn't have before. Um, ideas, things to do. He's given me a dream and and things that I want to fulfil, and that's really amazing. And and when I in December when my marriage ended, I couldn't see anything. It looked really bleak. Um, and I can only thank Jesus and Hope House for what they've done in my life. I really can. Honestly, the staff are amazing. Uh, you really are. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they, they put up with a lot <laughs> from us. Um, yeah, but um, <laughs> it's really nice seeing the other, some of the other girls here that were older on the program when I first came in. And they say they can see the change in me as well. Um, so yeah, I just I just want to give God all the glory, and I just want to uh, I just want to finish with a scripture that's um, come up for me a lot in Hope House um, since I've been there, and it's from Isaiah 54. I'm not going to read the whole one, but it says, um, "Sing, O barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy, you who were never in labour, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband." Says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, do not hold back. Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Do not be afraid, you will not suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace, you will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood, for your maker is your husband. And um, I just want to stand here as well and say that one of the most amazing things is that this is the first time in 16 years that I've been able to live without a single drink or an antidepressant. And that's (laughs) God.
Amen. Amen. Wonderful. And, you know, as Lucy said, you know, when these girls come to Hope House, they have so many suppressed dreams and gifts that they actually never realised they had. And the next girl, Hayley, she's going to come and she's going to um, read a poem that she wrote herself. Hayley Day. I'm Hayley and I'm from Hertfordshire, I'm from England. Um, I've been on the programme for four months now. Um, I wrote this poem, it's called The Thief, it's based on John 10.10 10, and you know, the essence of it is just that, you know, Satan's really real and he really does, he comes to really kill and destroy and steal everything that we have or that we had and you know, he really tried to do that for me but we have Jesus and you know, he saves us and he really, you know, he's really turned my life around and you know, so let's, I'll, I'll share the poem then that I've written. All right. The thief comes to kill, steal and destroy. He plays with your emotions as if they were a toy. He steals your happiness, joy and fun. He takes your wife, mum, sister or son. He can kill your progress, prospects, freedom or job. He can bring you to tears with a gut-wrenching sob. The thief can destroy lives, future and hope making people turn to drink and drugs to cope. But there is some good news in all of this, a hopeful message sealed with a kiss. We have a loving saviour who breathes in life, takes away the pain, tears and strife. He defends us, loves us and cares, protects us from the devil's snares. Our God, our saviour, our beloved Jesus, he always hears and always sees us. So don't let the thief get to you. Turn to our loving Lord. He knows just what to do. Amen. Amen. That was amazing. Now the next, next young looks. The next young lady that's going to come and share is, you know, she's a new part lass, so she's very special to you guys, and that's Kelly. You know, Kelly's come through the programme, but she's, come on. But she's just going to just update you and share with you what's after, what she's been doing since the programme and her dreams and where she wants to go. And while she's doing that, the girls are going to prepare to do the skit. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, as Bev said, my name is Kelly and I'm 44 and I'm from Newport. Um, <laughs> I went into the programme 2015. I was on heroin for 10 years, but as well as heroin, I was taking speed. I was a heavy drinker, and I was prescribed pre-gabs and diazepam too. So really, I took everything you could really possibly take. Um, I, I'd done the programme, which wasn't a really bad programme for me. I just got on with it. I just knew it was either that way or no other way. You know, um, I finished the programme, and I went to the Leadership Academy. It was a really privilege for me to go to the Leadership Academy in Nottingham. Uh, and on my holidays, I, I come back to Newport to see my kids for a little while, but I'd always go back to Hope House because that's where my heart was, was there for the girls. So um, on holidays and breaks, I'd always go back there and, and work and volunteer. So um, after the school finished then in July this year, I, ca I came back to Hope House. I'm um, training to be the detox officer there. You know, absolutely brilliant. You know, Jesus has absolutely changed my life. That program has changed my life. Um, when I got to the program, um, I'd lost my two boys. I lost my boys eight years ago to heroin. Now I've got, you know, I, my, my, I spoke to them now and again when I was on the heroin or tried to meet up with them or, or always let them down really. But now I've got a good relationship with my two boys. I got a 21 year old Sheldon and I got an 18 year old boy Cole who are still in Newport. But I, I do it, I'm in really good contact with them. And my mum never spoke to me for eight years because she had my two boys. Oops. And, but now my mum speaks to me. Me and my mum speaks like we've never ever stopped speaking. So I thank Jesus every day for my life. And thanks for having me. <laughs> Amen.
<laughs> it's too old for all this, huh? Yeah. You know, words are powerful. Really, really powerful. You know, and I know that there's not one person in this room that cannot relate to at least one or all of those names and those labels. You know, we give God thanks that when he comes and he touches you, he just tears every single label off. Glory be to God. So at this time, we're going to have a reflection from Christine. And then Sam will follow her with her testimony. About four or five weeks ago, I, um, I received a breakthrough scripture, and it's Ezekiel 16, um, verses 4 to 5. Um, okay, so, when you were born, no one cared about you. Your umbilical cord was left uncut, and you were never washed, rubbed with salt, and dressed in warm clothing. No one had the slightest interest in you, no one pitied you or cared for you. On the day you were born, you were dumped in a field and left to die unwanted. But I came by and saw you there, helplessly kicking about in your own blood. As you lay there, I said, live. Now this scripture, I've been waiting all my life for. Um, I never felt part of my family. I was always indifferent, rejected, I felt unloved. Um, as a young child, I was always very godly-like. Um, this scripture has confirmed so strong in my heart that God was there from the very beginning and he was always there but I just never knew. I lived a very lonely and unloved life not ever knowing until now how much God truly loves me. I now have my identity back and I know what my purpose in life is. Now my life makes sense. What a massive revelation. What an amazing feeling. I'm now at peace. Amen. <laughs> Wow, that's the first time I've heard Christine say anything. <laughs> it's really blown me away, that's amazing, amazing, you know. And that's the God that we serve, you know, he gives you boldness and, you know, he really, you know, he says I will place the scripture in our heart. And that's what he does, he places scripture in each of our hearts. So thank you, Christina, that was amazing. So Sam, Sam is going to come and she's going to share her testimony. Give her a hand if you come. Hi everyone, my heart's going to pop out my chest. Um, uh, my name's Sam, um, I've been at Hope House for about five and a half months. Um, okay, I'll start right from the beginning. Um, I was born into parents who loved me, but because they come from a background that showed that no, them no love, they didn't have the tools to know how to show me love. Um, they were a middle class family, but as we know, God is not a respecter of, of persons. Um, and yeah, I wasn't really given any boundaries with my father. I could just do as I pleased and, and it, was, it was growing up around pubs, etc. And I just wanted to be like him. I aspired to him. I loved the pubs. I loved the smell, everything. You know how it is. Um, and my mother, she tried to give me uh, boundaries, but they conflicted with my father. So I was very confused, very confused. And I just wanted approval from my dad. You know, I loved him. And, and all he did was put me down and um, it just knocked me over every single time. But I was the eldest child of three, um, and my dad, as well as being a heavy drinker, he's a womanizer and gambler, so he come from a broken background, a very dysfunctional background, um, so he's not, he's not a well man. Um, but I, I was at a family barbecue when I was seven years old, and, and I, that was when I first got very drunk, and I was violently sick. But I just remember, even from that young age, it just made me feel whole. It was, it was weird, it just gave me that confidence, and I thought I had confidence, but obviously not, you know, and um, growing up. And, yeah, I, when, I, when I was at school, um, from 13, I, I took drugs and, and regularly drank at school, and I got expelled uh, with poor, poor qualifications. And then after that, I went to college for a couple of years and got myself a full-time job, and I settled down for a little bit, and I thought, okay, I'm all right now, do you know what I mean? And... But it wasn't, and, and you know, soon, soon enough I started drinking again, um, quite heavily, and taking more drugs. But, but my, my thing was, I was a binger, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd 
be on and off all the time. I just didn't think I had a problem. I really didn't, um, and, it, and it was normal. I normalised it, but when I did drink, it was very chaotic and destructive, uh, very violent, lots of fights, um, you know, and, and very promiscuous. I was codependent. Um, I just felt empty, and I, I, was, I was scared to be alone, really scared to be alone, and I chased excitement all the time. I was in and out of violent relationships, um, you know, on both parts, and, and uh, yeah, got arrested quite a few times. Uh, went to prison a handful of times, and, and I managed to get myself two years sober in AA, um, about three, three or four years ago now, but I relapsed for a couple of years, and that's when um, it turned into daily drinking. Um, and, you know, I was with this partner, and it, it, again, it was destructive, it was violent, um, you know, he almost strangled me and, and stuff, and, but I just felt so lonely still, even though I was with him all the time, and, um, yeah, it was awful, but I tried everything, you know, from, from day programs, therapists, psychologists, absolutely everything, nothing worked, nothing, not AA worked, because, um, like I said, I relapsed. And I went to prison at the beginning of the year, only for a short time, but it was long enough for me to realise that, do you know what, I don't want this life anymore, I really don't want this life anymore. And God made a way for me that, where there was no way, and he brought me to Hope House. Um, yeah, it was, you know, and I just, just turned up there and thought, what am I doing here, do you know what I mean? It was like, I was desperate, I was broken, I was lost, there was no other way, I just didn't know what to do, didn't know what to do. And one week in, I accepted Jesus into my life, because I come from an um, atheist background, and, um, but yeah, thank God, you know, and it's since it's just turned my life around in, internally. And, and now I'm feeling, I'm, I feel complete. I feel complete now, um, you know, and I invited Jesus in, into my life as Lord and Saviour. I just focus on him all the time. There's no going back for me now. And, and yeah, you know, it's just, yeah. <laughs> I love him. <laughs> I love him. Um, and I was baptized a couple of months ago, so definitely not, not, no going back. And, um, you know, now I've, like uh, the scripture, 1 Peter 2.10 says, once I had no identity, now I am God's child. And once I received no mercy, now I have received God's mercy. And God makes the impossible possible. He really does. And he deserves all the glory. I love him. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sam. Amazing testimonies. So the girls are going to come and sing their final song and then followed by that will be Alicia who's going to wrap up and share what God's put in her heart for you. Again, oh, can I be turned up a wee bit, please? It's number two. <laughs> um, so now we're going to sing the song "Lord, I Need You," um, and I think after hearing all of these um, ladies' testimonies, we know how much we need God in our lives, and I'm sure you can all relate to that. We need Jesus, and at some point, I'm sure we've all made that secret prayer in our hearts and said, "Lord, I need You." Um, so we're going to sing that now and sing along with us. I'm sure you all know the song well. Um, and if I could just be a little bit louder, that would be great. Thank you very much. You got a mic. One second. Is there another one there? Mm.
Aren't they brilliant? Yes. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you, ladies. So proud to see you all up here and sharing what God laid upon your hearts. So I'm not going to be long, just wrapping it all up, as Beverly said. I'm just going to read a few verses from Psalm 139. And it's from a new translation that uh, Fiona over there introduced me to. It's called the Passion Translation. So I don't know if any of you have come across that. The Passion Translation. It says this. Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every moment of my heart and soul. And you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book. You know all about the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. You know every step I will take before my journey even begins. You've gone into my future to prepare the way. And in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from harm of my past. Your hand of love upon my life, you impart a blessing to me. This is just too wonderful, deep, and incomprehensible. Your understanding of me brings me wonder and strength. Where could I go from your spirit? Where could I run and hide from your face? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I go down to the realm of the dead, you are there. If I fly with wings into the shining dawn, you are there. If I fly into the radiant sunset, you are there waiting. Wherever I go, your hand will guide me. Your strength will empower me. It is impossible to disappear from you or to ask the darkness to hide me. For your presence is everywhere, bringing light into my night. There is no such thing as darkness with you. The night to you is as bright as the day. There is no difference between the two. You formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside and wove them together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it. How thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place, carefully, skillfully shaping me from nothing to something. You saw who you, create, you, saw who you created me to be before I became me, before I'd even seen the light of day. The number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. And every single moment, you are thinking of me. How precious and wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought. O oh God, your desire towards me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. And when I awake each morning, you're still with me. That's some fantastic words, isn't it, about the love of God and the care that he has for each one of us. I'm going to ask you a couple of little questions just to start now. How many of you like your designer labels? I know Beverly likes her designer labels. A few? Yes, we know you do, Paula. <laughs> How many of you like to go clothes shopping? Yes. Oh, yes. We like to go to clothes shopping. Do you know, a recent survey in the Daily Telegraph says this. On average, everybody spends £1,042 on clothes every year. £1,042. Now, surprisingly, that's £74 a month for every woman and £100 for you fellas every month you're spending on clothes. A woman has 95 items approximately in her cupboard and she will wear 59% of them. A guy, he has 56 items in his cupboard and he'll wear 61% of them. And I bet you never know this, a woman is our most happiest when she's wearing something new. So my question tonight is this, whose design 
Whose design are you wearing? Whose design are you wearing? Those girls just did a very powerful drama. More and more labels were placed upon Jackie. She was wearing a design, and the designer's aim is to rob, to kill, and to destroy. He wants to take everything from confidence and self-esteem to eventually her life. Each label went on and she sank lower and lower and lower. Under a weight of rejection, despair and depression. That designer's aim is to have each one of us wearing his creations. He wants to trap us into a place we cannot escape from, to isolate us, to cause fear in our life, to bring darkness and eventually death. His designs come in all types of styles. One of his most extreme designs is called addiction. But he has others, and they were mentioned earlier when the young lady got up. They're called self-harm and suicide. There is extreme designs. There's far more acceptable designs, and many of us are wearing them. They're called anger. They're called loneliness. They're called depression and fear. And as I said, low self-esteem, rejection, hatred, unforgiveness. The list can go on and on and on. It's all those negative labels that push us into a place of feeling misunderstood, no good, unaccepted, unable to cope, and absolutely isolated. And as I said, the Bible says this about that designer. He's coming to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And he wants to take the very essence of life that has been deposited within us. But I just read Psalm 139, the most poetical version of that psalm. And it's talking about another designer whose aim is to give life and life in all of its fullness. This designer knew us long ago, before we were even thought of by our mum and dad. He had us on the designer's uh, plaque, if you like, working out everything there was about us. He knew what we would look like. He knew what our personality would be. He knew how tall or how short we were going to be. He decided the colour of our eyes and the colour of our hair. He decided what talents we would have. And he placed deep dreams and desires within us. We were purposed to be born. Ephesians 2.10 says we are his masterpiece. We were created anew in Christ Jesus to do the good things that were planned for us long ago. Genesis chapter 1 tells me about this designer. It says that everything he does is good. Everything he does is good. Every one of us in this room, we are good. There's no accident here. We're all purposed, we're all designed, and we are all instinctively good. When we come and accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Saviour, his forgiveness, his truth, removed the design of the devil, the negative labels that he had placed upon us, those crushing, life-taking designs were removed when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. The design of the Creator came upon us at that time. And you know that design is more expensive than every other designer label you will ever come across. It's more expensive than a Victoria Beckham dress. It's more expensive than an Armani coat. It is the most expensive design you can ever come across. And this is what the Bible says about it. God paid a ransom to save you from your empty life that you had inherited from your ancestors. It was not paid with mere gold or silver, which loses their value. It was purchased by the precious blood of Christ, the sinless Lamb of God. God chose him as a ransom long before 
he made the world. It was a priceless design that we are wearing, a costly design that the Creator God has placed upon us. My mum loves watching the Antiques Roadshow. Do any of you watch the Antiques Roadshow? She loves it. And sometimes on there, they bring out this painting that's maybe been in the attic for years upon years upon years, and you cannot really tell what it is or who the designer is, but the guy who brings it out knows exactly what it is the minute he sees it. He sees past the grime, he sees past the dirt, and he sees the worth of a masterpiece. And sometimes, later on, once that masterpiece has been cleaned up, they bring it back onto the show for you to see. It's absolutely outstanding and worth an awful lot. That's what we have the privilege of seeing every single day in Team Challenge. I know we don't have to tell you. I know we don't have to tell you about the ministry of Teen Challenge because you've got your own Teen Challenge people here who tell you all about it. You've got Gareth who's been here for I don't know how many years. <laughs> and Laura and Jamelia, they tell you, and other people have come and been a part of this beautiful church here. And so they've told you about the work that goes on in Teen Challenge. But it really is the creator's place where he takes broken, broken lives and absolutely restores them to what they're meant to be. The master craftsman takes all the dirt and all the grime away and places back on each woman the design that carries his label. And those labels are things like this. It's loved, it's belong, it's unique, it's beautiful, it's special, treasured, accepted, forgiven, chosen, blessed, purposed, righteous, valued, holy, royalty, I could go on and on. There's many, many labels from that great designer. And you might have sat here tonight, and you may have listened to the stories, and may, you may never have known that designer. You may never have known that creator. You may never have known that there was a, a saviour called Jesus Christ who gave his life as a ransom so you can stop wearing the negative labels and put on the design of Christ. And when I finished, if you don't know Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to come and to know him and to find out about him. But I also want to talk about those labels, the labels that Jackie was wearing. Each one of those labels have its roots in sin. If you remember the beginning of the Bible, there's a story about two people called Adam and Eve. They lived in perfection. There was not one negative label in their world. It was perfect. It was lovely. There was no negativity. There was no jealousy. There was no weighing each other up. There was nothing but perfection. And all of a sudden, sin came into their world. They listened to a voice that said, did God truly say, or in other words, is God who he says he is? And they fell for that big trick, and they took the apple and they ate it, and along came sin, and along came with it all the negative things that we now experience in life. They were ashamed. Not very long after that came jealousy, low self-esteem, and you've only got to read a few chapters on, and we come to the first murder. All the negative stuff of life came in because of sin. And it wasn't long before God said, I've had enough of this and I've got to start all over again. But sin was still there and it was still um, bringing all the negative things into our lives. But Jesus Christ paid the price of sin. And I just read it was a high price, but he paid it and he totally broke the power of every label over our lives. He broke it. It has no power over us because Jesus Christ paid the price of sin. This is what Isaiah says in chapter 53 about Jesus. He took on our suffering and felt our pain. We saw his suffering and thought God was punishing him, but he was wounded for every wrong that we did. He was crucified for every evil we did. 
the punishment which made us well was given to him and we are healed because of his wounds on the cross somebody said it earlier about the price of the cross and the blood that was shed it wasn't just a crucifixion it was a whipping there were thorns that were so deep in his head they were like that and they dripped blood consistently on that cross when Jesus died he said three words it is finished it is finished his blood paid the price for our sin his blood breaks the power of every label that has been placed on us his blood heals every pain every word and every action that is behind every label that we would wear every lie that we were not created to hold his blood has already paid the price for the power of the cross it breaks it over our lives but the sad situation today is this that many Christians still wear those labels the world throw them on us situations throw them on us people speak them over us and before we know it the lie takes hold of us and we're living it all over again when Jesus Christ has already removed it completely from us in the Bible Jesus tells a story about a young man a young man who asked his dad for his inheritance and he took the lot and he went to a faraway country and spent every penny he had had and by doing that his actions said dad as far as I'm concerned you're dead and I want nothing more to do with you but you know the story when all the money ran out and all his friends had left him and he was Billy no mates left on his own with nothing and he ended up eating with pigs because he was so low he says to himself I think I'll go back to my dad because at least my dad will take me on as a slave and I'll have a meal each day but if you know the story that dad was looking for that boy every single day and as soon as he came on the horizon that dad ran to that boy and took him into his arms and accepted him back into his family and it's a picture of what Jesus Christ has done for each one of us we turned our back on him we thought the punishment that was laid on him was his own but it was ours and we walked away but he brought us back and that dad puts three things on that boy he gives him a robe that covers all the dirt and all the grime and says son you are mine I accept you your home I love you this is your rightful place and this is a place of security he gives him a ring that says son you've got all my authority everything I have is yours I totally provide for you he puts shoes on his feet that says son you're not a slave because it's only slaves that don't have shoes you're my son you're my child and you're home and you're mine it's a picture of what father God does for us when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior that father showed unconditional love on the son mercy forgiveness and grace and we've received the same we've received the same and yet we allow the lies of that devil to be put upon us once again and we begin to live in the label that has been removed we need to live in the truth of the cross we need to live in the power of the cross there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus we are forgiven we are accepted we are loved we are righteous we are secure we are valued we are loved we are purposed and we are significant we are significant for every negative label this world tries to put on you 
the Bible has a positive one. Christ has a positive one. This morning, in my church, we were singing a song by Life Church. It's got some powerful words about the cross. It says this, I find my freedom at the cross. I find my freedom at the cross. Where my sin was crucified, Jesus brought me back to life. I find my freedom at the cross. I find forgiveness in your blood. I find forgiveness in your blood. Once for all my Saviour died, Jesus, I owe you my life. I find forgiveness in your blood. I find my healing in your scars. I find my healing in your scars. Bruised and broken for my sin, raised to life and victory, I find my healing in your scars. And redeemed by love, by grace forgiven, Jesus, your perfection brought my freedom. Though the, through the nails and the scars, you won my healing. All praise to you, the Lamb of Heaven. It is finished. You have spoken. Death defeated. Chains are broken. King of Heaven, you have won my freedom at the cross. We don't need to wear those labels. We don't need to take on board what the world says about us. We don't have to have them pinned so deeply on us that we can't break free from what the words behind them are saying or the actions or the memories or whatever it is that that devil used to place that label on us. We are free. It's finished. It is done at the cross. That designer... That designer is so crafty that he brings his design and he'll slip it on us sometimes without us even knowing. And there are times when we need somebody to come and stand alongside us and to show us once again, you don't need to be wearing that label. You can take that label off. You don't have to live under that condemnation. You don't have to live under that lie. James says this, confess your sin one to another. Pray. And the prayer will bring healing into your life. I'm going to give back to the... Sorry, I don't know your name. I'm going to give back to John. But I want you to, to know that we're here to pray with you. We're here to pray with you if you know... If you don't know Jesus and you want to get to know him, we're here to pray with you. If you've got a label that you just cannot break free of, because we want to stand alongside you, we want to point you to the truth, and we want to help you live in the designer's clothes. Amen. Thank you so much for that word. Um, we do invite you to stay. There is tea and coffee and some nibbles afterwards, so please don't rush off. Um, but before anyone does rush off, I'm just going to take two more minutes of your time. And I just think, give an opportunity, really, before we sing our last song, give an opportunity to respond to the word and everything that you've heard. You've heard some amazing testimonies. And girls, thank you for your bravery, because it's no mean feat laying yourself out in that way to strangers. So thank you so much for your bravery. But I'm just going to ask that every head is bowed. And I'm doing this because I don't want to cause anyone embarrassment. So I'd ask that you don't look around the, the church. But really just, this is between you and God. I'm just listening to the message about the designer labels and I was hearing what was being said. Do you know what the label that Christ wants to put on us is eternal? And... We just want to respond to the message and give you an opportunity. Because I don't know whether you're right with Christ. Only he does. And so the call is, will you respond to him tonight? Many of us in this church believe that Christ is returning soon. And oh boy, I, I want to be able to know that every one of you in this building tonight doesn't go out without knowing him. Because it would be the saddest day to know that you walk out of here and you've rejected Christ. Because when you stand before him and he says to you, why should I let you into heaven? And you give all the excuses under the sun. And then you turn around and say, but I never knew. And he'll turn to you and he said, yes, but you did. On that night in Trinity, 
on a Sunday evening, you knew what you needed to do, but you walked out of that building and you rejected my son Jesus. Don't let that be your label. But allow Christ to help you and guide you and become a savior of life. If you feel that's you tonight, and there's no embarrassment because every eye, and I'm watching, every eye is bowed and, and closed. I'm going to ask if that's for you tonight, if you feel that tonight is the, the night that you really want to get to know Jesus, that you want him to be part of your life, I'm just going to ask that you just quietly raise your hand, just to indicate, thank you, just to indicate that you tonight want to receive him, bless you. Oh, bless you, thank you so much. I tell you what, there's a party going on in heaven tonight. All right, you can put your hand down because I don't want to embarrass you. I'm just going to pray and not to cause embarrassment. If you'd like to, to pray, we're all going to pray, okay? You know who you are and you can pray this prayer. Some people call it the sinner's prayer. I call it the gateway into heaven. It's the prayer that allows us access into heaven. It's the prayer that allows Jesus to come into your life because you give him permission. God's a gentleman. He never forces himself upon anyone. He likes to be invited, and tonight you're inviting him into your life. Okay, so let's pray this. And you can pray it quietly. Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for your son, Jesus. I recognize that I have not allowed you to be part of my life all these years. recognize tonight I must make myself right with you therefore Lord Jesus Christ I acknowledge that you died for me that the cross was for me that the blood that you shed was for me and that everything that you achieved on the cross was for me recognize that in front of you I am a sinner and I come before you now Lord Jesus and in faith I accept the free gift of salvation that you've offered to me Lord Jesus Christ I invite you into my life to be my Lord and my Saviour Holy Spirit, I invite you into my life to take control of my thoughts, my mind, and all my life, because now I belong to Jesus Christ.